Uh, and in general, you know, I didn't pick a triad, but in general, a triad would might be something like this. So it's not going to be dark enough. It might be light enough, but it's not gonna be dark enough or it's gonna be the opposite. It'll be something like this where it might be dark enough, but it's not gonna be light enough. So if, if you have to just paint in black, white, and gray, just go get um, pure black, pure white, rainy gray, misty gray, stormy gray, whatever the gray colors are called. That'll probably be easier. If you don't feel comfortable picking out colors or mixing colors, that will be easier than trying to figure this out in the next two minutes. There's somebody that asks, uh, they have Reaper Ruddy ground, Brown instead of Ruddy Leather. Are they the same? They're not the same, but I think the Ruddy Brown should work fine. And then somebody else asks where to find a copy of the value scale. Uh, I think I stole that from online. I have made my own since then, but um, so I don't put this in printed material that I publish on the web, but I'm pretty sure that I stole this particular one online and then I just adjusted the colors to show them my colors. So if you search in 10, 10 point value scale or six point value scale, you should be able to find this idea. So it's not, 10 is pretty common and five is pretty common. Um, but all kinds of art use this. So these are super easy to find. Um, Brian, I think that's something you set. You can pick a window that you pin open. I do not remember exactly how to do that, but if you look up at the top at Zoom and it, it Sarah, if you'd like to explain that, if you know how to do it better. Uh, but each viewer picks what they're looking at on Zoom. So you can set it so that it's switched to whoever's talking, or you can pin my video. I think that's I think you need it. to have it set to gallery view instead of speaker view. Yes, that sounds right. Um, the other thing, if you could have it, is a hairdryer. So I've, I've done this cooking show style where I've got the various steps of my guy prepared. So I actually have, you know, a bunch of them. Um, I don't need that many, but I, just in case. Um, but this will, there will be points where we might be ready to move on. And what's gonna be holding you back is your paint being wet. And I will try to take hair dryer breaks where I'm not talking so that you know, you're not missing anything. Um, I have a lot of brushes partly so I can show you some stuff, but you're gonna need something to just apply paint to the miniature. Um, there's actually a lot of scales, so I wouldn't pick a little tiny, this is even, this isn't even tiny, this is a Reaper size two, but I wouldn't go get your little tiny zeros or whatever. There's nothing on this figure yet. So there's no need to worry about if you get some paint on the base or whatever. This, I mean, I airbrush this guy for speed. Um, but when, when I do base coats, it very frequently looks like this. I would have gotten paint on the shield and I don't care because I haven't painted the shield yet. So that part, we're not gonna try and be neat. And in fact, if you have all your supplies, go ahead and start putting on your base coat of whatever, either your middle value color, your mid-tone, because we're gonna add a darker wash and then we're gonna do lighter uh, dry brushing. Or if you're using the same colors I am, go ahead and start putting a coat of your Numeria, Numeria, Numeria rust onto your um, figure. Uh, somebody asked, uh, they have a heat gun. Do you recommend a temp and a fan speed? Uh, when I use a hair dryer, I use it on low. So whatever would be equivalent to that. And then you, uh, a little heat is fine, but you probably want more air if you can have your settings for whatever does that on it. I'm not super familiar with heat guns. I've used heat guns on miniatures. Um, but if you have to, then just hold the figure further away would be another way to do it. So you do not need 25 brushes. I partly just brought these to demonstrate to you. So the round, and I have this weird triangle brush, that's mostly for the base coating. So I just wanted to have a few different examples for that. If you have a brush with a nicer point or something a little smaller, we'll use those for the belly scales. So that's going to be for later. If we get there, if people don't get there, um, don't panic about it. There's stuff in the, in the handout. So you'll still get information on that. But um, I noticed some uh, some comments in the Discord that some people were feeling like classes went too fast. And I know I've spoken with other people and they're like, well, I expected to learn more. I'm gonna have to try to balance this 
to like where the majority of people are. But don't panic if you're feeling a little behind, if you're a slow painter, just do part of it, like just do to the, the join on the figure, particularly if you haven't um, filled it in. Because that join, you know, even the wash, you won't get a weird look if you if you break at that joint and then do the tail part later. Or even just accept that you do half and half later and you're gonna see it a little bit. My goal in a class is for you to learn information, not for you to walk out with a finished figure that looks amazing. Um, so don't stress yourself out trying to finish the entire figure. Concentrate on trying to learn the principles. And if you have to, like just stop painting and take notes because they're recording this uh, it's probably going to be a month or so before it goes up. They've got like dozens of these to edit and, and put up on the web. I may make a, a video in the meantime, but you're going to be able to see this again. So if you try it and something doesn't turn out perfectly, just remember that in a month you're going to be able to go on a Reaper's channel and watch this again and pause and try again and take it as slowly as you need to. Um, so just for the people who might have gotten here a little late, I saw somebody was medicating their cat and their order never arrived. Um, if you look at the class handout, which I think Sarah will be kind and link again, there are suggestions for alternate um, figures and alternate paints. So these are the ones I'm using in the class, but these are not the only possibilities. If you have any of these snake pen, they're great. Um, I didn't like the command troops as much because they have the too much stuff on them, but for in terms of you practicing while we're um, while we're having the class, they would work fine. Uh, if you have one of these guys, a lot of people have him, I think. Uh, there's a giant snake that's wrapped around a rock. There's a couple of different, basically just if you have something that has these larger belly plates and then smaller scales like that, that's all, all you need to practice. In terms of paints, what you need is kind of a progression like this, where you have a very dark color and a very light color, and you have a color in the middle, and then kind of two bridges between the middle color and the light color, and then between the middle color and the dark color. In, um, in reference to your color scheme, there's a question in the Q&A that is asking, would doing a green as the darkest color, uh, but let me rephrase that, um, would doing green with the darkest color being brown be okay? So they want like a green? If it's a very dark green. Okay. So if you have like green liner or um, there's black green or green black, the name kept changing. Uh, I, they mean brown as the midtone. Um, I mean, they mean green as the midtone, brown as the shadow. It would if if it's a, a lighter green and brown. I mean, it's it might work. It depends on your green. If it's more of like a khaki style green, I think a brown would work. A dark blue would probably work better if you have a vivid green like this. And that's exactly what I used in the shadows of this is blue liner. So if you have a bright green like that. I would say dark blue would work better or black with a little bit of blue in it. Um, if you have more of like khaki green, then uh, dark brown should work. But also you could go ahead and try it. I mean, you're practicing. So if you don't mind that it might turn out awesome, might not turn out awesome. So this is a value scale for another way of looking at what I was talking about. If you think of, you know, your paints kind of go like we have very light colors and then we have dark colors. So you want a very light color and you want a very dark color. It doesn't necessarily have to be like straight black and straight white. Um, my colors aren't quite, they're, they're more like in between there. Then you want something in the middle and you want, you're either gonna have to mix or have a bridge between those two. And then somebody else asked if they can use orange instead of Numeria Rust. Um, I put my suggestions for the colors that are closest. Other than that, you're going to have to make a, a judgment based on this. So if you go in the handout, it has my suggestions for the Reaper paints that are closest in colors to these colors. Um, I don't know what orange you're talking about and I would have to get up and go look at it. So it might work, hopefully it would work. Um, I, if you use an orange in the middle, I would use a, you know, a brighter orange and a yellow. You said a lava orange. I would use like true, I would use like sun yellow and a true orange for these colors instead, or it might look a little weird. It should work, but um, th that's the problem. With, so when I teach classes in person, I bring the paints and I make you use the paints I have so that we don't have to worry about this because I'm not going to be talking a lot about color selection. I'm going to be talking about techniques. 
um, color selection would be a different class. And maybe one day I can do that class if I start doing uh, the Reaper, the Twitch show on Reaper. I think that might be something worth talking about is, you know, how do you pick your wash colors and how do you pick your dry brush colors and stuff. But um, I, we're already, you know, what, 15 minutes in and hopefully you guys are painting. So those of you that have picked out paints, start putting your base coat color on there. Just use the paint straight out of the bottle. Don't thin it unless your paint is like 10 years old. Um, and I'll explain I'll, I'll talk about what I do for base coating, but I don't want you to be held up waiting for paint to dry. So hair dryer and just paints where you have something dark, something light, something in the middle, and you either mix or you have two bridge colors. So are we good on, you know, paint and figure questions? And I'll, I'm going to talk about using these. You don't have to have these. You can use just water for what we're going to do today. But there's often a lot of questions about those. On my class tomorrow, we'll have a lot more information on using additives and um, mediums and stuff. The same person that asked the orange question also asked, um, are you painting walnut on the belly too? Um, yes, if you want to go ahead. So you can wait and anytime you don't have something else to do, you could paint that walnut on or you can start doing it now if you, if you, uh, you might need to touch up the edges after we do the, we're going to do the small scales first and then come back to the walnut. But yeah, we're going to go from darkest to lighter on the belly. Which hopefully we'll get there. I, I can't guarantee that we are going to get there. Um, this is just so you guys know, like I know it's tough for you because you can't see everything exactly and you can't talk to me directly. It's tough for us because I'm used to doing an in-person class where I can look around the room and see if people's faces look confused or if they're getting impatient and they're ready to move on or if they need more time. And I don't have any of that feedback right now. So this has been a really weird transition to move to the online world. So, um, I want to talk about kind of base coat consistency. Um, Reaper paints, in my opinion, at least relatively fresh from the factory, come at what I consider a good consistency for base coats. So what I want with the base coat, or you know, like my first layer of paint on the figure, however you want to think about it, I want it to, you know, you want it to be as opaque as possible. You don't want to paint 14 coats if you don't have to, but you also don't want to cover up detail. So that's all I'm looking for is it just, is it thin enough that it's not covering up detail? And my test for that, I'm actually gonna use a slightly less nice brush, is if you run the brush through it, let's see, let's see if I can get that a little closer to the camera. If you run the brush through it, if you think of the brush as a boat and you get like a wake behind a boat when it's going through the water, does that wake fill in almost immediately? That's pretty fluid paint that's not gonna leave texture on your figure. So this is pretty, this is pretty much exactly correct. Um, th so this is the consistency of paint that I almost always use for base coats and even wet blending and stuff like that. So I'm going to give you the extreme example of um, paint being too thick. But in, if you've had paint for a few years, kind of sitting in your garage or whatever, it may have thickened up because even though the paints are in plastic bottles, it can get, um, you know, it evaporates out of the bottom. So these are art store color paints. You can already see, I mean, if I put out a fresh drop of this that I haven't spread out. So there's a test right there. Which one is flowing and which one isn't? Well, if it isn't flowing like that, it's probably too thick. If I run my brush through here, you can see it starts filling in like, it, but it's, you can see that ridge for a while. So that paint is too thick to put on a miniature. I would potentially, you know, you can see it's, it's not quite like frosting, but I can make little peaks. That is what would potentially fill in detail. This paint is like super thick. I mean, the wake is never going to fill in. That's how thick the paint is that I, I can make textures with it. So I would definitely have to thin that paint down before I could apply it to a miniature. So hopefully that, that makes sense for a good way to tell for your base coat, um, whether you have the right consistency or not. So for most of us, Reaper paints straight out of the bottle are gonna be the right consistency. So then let's talk about a few tips for putting that uh, base coat on. So in, I talked a bit about the brushes. If I wanted to be super precise and clean, I might have to use a smaller brush, but I haven't got anything else done on the miniature yet. 
And one thing we know about acrylic paint is that it covers over other acrylic paint. This isn't oil paint. I don't have to wait, you know, two days for it to dry or whatever. So if I get this over there and then I paint the walnut on later, I mean, right now you're trying to do both so that you're able to do both the parts of the class. But so let's say I, to make sure that I get in the crevice, I get paint on the base. I don't care. I haven't painted the base yet. When I get there, then I can get out a smaller brush and be super precise. But even this brush, which is a size two, which is a decent size round brush, it's going to take me a minute. So um, this is a weird brush that, that uh, Amanda actually gave me a couple years ago at Reaper. But these things work pretty well for base coating because you get you get like a thick part, but you also get like a point. And I think they have these at the craft store. I can start covering a lot more ground with that. I mean, I've already got the back of the miniature finished in the same amount of time. And it took me to paint just a small area. So where you can use a bigger brush and you feel comfortable with it, use a bigger brush. Now, I don't know if, so I don't know if you saw that there was a big bubble there and I'm not sure whether you can see on camera that there are some little small bubbles. So there's a big bubble. I can just grab a brush and pop it. And there are little small bubbles. You can kind of blow on it. Something I like to do, and that's happening because this is a textured surface and I was painting fast. But um, it, so I'm actually having to look at it over the end of my glasses if you don't have good lighting in. Um, let's see if we can actually, I might be able to focus in more. This camera is a bit blurry. Yeah, it's totally ignoring me because it went to auto. Somebody uh, in Q&A said that they heard once, if there's a lot of bubbles, you have too much water. Um, it's friction against the texture. Now, there may be times when it's that, but it's because I was painting fast um, and there's a lot, a lot of texture and I was painting in the opposite direction of the texture. So I've, I've noticed like you won't find it happen as much. None of these guys have a nice cloak. Well, she has something. So I can take the same big brush and the same paint that you saw, I took straight out of the bottom, I didn't pin down. It's not gonna make a bubble there, well, it made one because there's not really any texture. When I come back to the scales, a lot of the bubbles have popped out. They haven't all popped out, but they, some of them have popped out. Um, so I could blow on it, which I'm not gonna subject you to listening to. But something I like to do is that canned air stuff. You don't go full strength. So you, you kind of learn to work the trigger. You see how it just sounds a little. If you have a lot of paint on there, it will blow paint around. So I don't, I'm not that worried because I haven't painted anything else on here. If I'd finished a lot of the miniature, I would certainly be being very careful with this. And I'm not necessarily recommending that you do that until you practice with it. But I find that tip very helpful. And all the bubbles I had just, just popped. The other thing that I had done just now, and I kind of fixed it by blowing the bubbles on it, but I will recreate the problem. So, here in his lower back, where it's up against the belt, and if you can see, there's kind of a little, like you can't really see any scales under there because I have so much paint. The paint is pooling. It's gonna take forever to dry. It will dry eventually, but it might cover up some of the detail. So I've got my, I clean my brush off and it's damp. So I can just go in and pick up that excess paint. So as you're doing your, um, base coat, if you're not doing it the super clean, precise way where you're being very careful, you're going to need to do stuff like that where you check for paint that's pooling, you check for bubbles, because if those little bubbles dry, it will create like a ring, like you'll see a ring of texture that you've added. So that's a brush I might use for base coating. Um, if, if, you know, those seem like too crazy big, this size of brush is pretty good. I've been enjoying this one. And it, obviously it depends on the area if you're painting, you know, somebody's face and it's much smaller, but the, for base coating, I mean, this is not the part of the miniature that you want to have take a long time. This is not the fun part. This is like, if I could hire somebody to do this part for me, I probably would. So I still see a little bit of a bubble there. So you can break the bubbles with uh, the tip of a damp brush. You can kind of blow on them or you can use that compressed air or if you have an airbrush hooked up on a regular basis, 
you know, if you like regularly keep an airbrush at your station, you can use just that it's a dual action. You can just have it spritz air and not paint and pop them that way. So does everyone feel like that answered your most common questions about doing base coats? Uh, somebody asked how far does the how far up does the walnut go on the figure? Um, I I debated that too. So my decision was to kind of make a triangle shape on his chest. But if you feel like these scales under his neck are also that same kind of scale, you're welcome to do that. That's one of those areas where we get to kind of make our own choices and have fun as painters. But um, for me, that just seemed a little easier because I'm, I'm definitely during the class probably not going to paint under there. I want to paint these nice big ones so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, I did, I forgot to show you my test bags actually. So this is, I mean, and it, it doesn't look like this is where we're going to get, but in theory, this is where we're going to get, unless I completely wrote down the wrong colors or something. So is it, it's not, doesn't seem very in focus. Is that a bit better? Um, and then the belly scales, I think I actually even need to ramp up the, the texture so that we can see a little more. Um, I, this was my first test scheme and it used a couple more colors paint and that I wanted to try to get the number of colors down, but just to show that the concept is, um, something that you can go on and apply to a green guy, or if you want to paint a bright orange one or a blue one or whatever, um, you can use a variety of different colors. Okay, so are we all feeling good about doing the base coat? So you guys continue working on that. Um, I'm, I think it, it's possible that some of you might be ready for a hairdryer break. So we're gonna do a hairdryer break and I'm gonna do this in case someone comes in late so they don't think that we've, um, you know, lost sound. Just trying to find my lid. Let's put it on here. So I'm not gonna talk and give you a few minutes to dry your figure. Okay, so um, most of you probably, I mean, if you've only done one coat, you probably need to do a second coat. Uh, so go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna talk about washes and then we'll have another hair dryer break um, before you guys do your wash. But since I did the cooking show thing, I don't have to wait for my guy. That was one of the reasons I picked this color is you may even only need to look for a few places that are a little lighter. Like if I look at mine, it's still wet up there, but I don't know if you can see it. It's not, uh, I can see some of the gray showing through. It's a little lighter here. I could even live with that for the point of view of the class. Uh, this is Numeria orange. Um, I think Russ Brown would also work, but if you check the link that Sarah just put in the chat, you will see the exact colors that I'm using and then also some suggested alternatives that you can pick. So um, I like to give at least two coats, even on a good covered, good coverage color like this, if I can, but because we're going to be applying paint over this, if you want to just live with, I can see a little bit of the gray through there, that's fine. But um, you guys can take some time now and work on a second coat and I'll do the kind of explanation part about washes and then you'll have a hair dryer break before you have to apply your mix and apply your wash. Let me just figure out what I'm doing with my palette for a minute. So this is the Dumeria Rust, but just kind of a mid-tone uh, red brown color. Okay. Yes, and those of you, if you have finished your uh, overall body, but you haven't started on the belly plates, feel free to start using the walnut brown on the belly plates. So the purpose of a wash 
is to uh, help define the texture that's already sculpted in the figure. So if you think of this as kind of like a macro view of the, the scales. So you've got depressions in between and then you've got areas where they're raised up. The point of the wash is that it's going to sink into these crevices and darken them. So we're gonna be able to see all the detail that the sculptor already put on our figure better. But the system's not perfect because we're gonna apply the wash all over the figure. So it's going to also color these raised parts. And we're gonna to have to do some stuff to bring back our original color. But that's the idea behind a wash is you're trying to concentrate darker color in these crevices to help bring out the texture. And dry brushing is sort of the reverse of that, but I'll get this back out and explain that then. So to do that, the, the paint that I showed you was a fine consistency for doing a base coat that goes all over everything and it's an even color and it coats pretty well. So that's not gonna do the job of what we want in a wash. We're gonna have to thin paint down. Um, I like to use something like this that's got a little depression in it, even a blister pack. When I was doing the washes on my guys prepping me for class, I just used an old blister pack. Um, you can, if you just have a flat, if you're using paper plate or wet palette, you can totally do this on that. Just, I find that way I don't worry about knocking my palette. So this is a ceramic style one that's easy to find in a store. This you should be able to get for like about $1.25 in a big box store, an art store, or craft store. These are a little harder to find. Um, but just something like that. We're not going to go down to the darkest color. If I put that over that, it's going to look dirty and kind of, it's going to take away too much of that middle color. Um, so you, you picking the colors is like a thing unto itself, as I, I was saying earlier, and I hope to talk about that on um, when the Twitch show gets up and running, that seems like a good topic. But in general, you want something that's somewhat darker and also duller. So if I get back my value scale, you know, if this is my middle color, because I'm painting something light, maybe I go down this dark for my wash color. If this is my wash color, I'll go down a few steps to something like this, but also a little duller. So if you look at this as like a grass green, this isn't as bright, it isn't as vivid. Um, so I can't, I'm not gonna go into too much more detail than that, but if you go on my YouTube channel, so just go to YouTube and look for Bird with a Brush. I've got a whole video of um, one of the first tests I did. I did this as a test snake for this class actually and I didn't like it. And I wasn't sure why I didn't like it. So I did a video about figuring out why I didn't like it and what I could have done differently. And I could use those colors with a different technique or I could use different colors for my wash was kind of the short answer. But if you watch the video, it, it talks you through, you know, how I decided there was a problem and then I, how I tried to figure out how to solve the problem. So even if you know color theory and you've done this for years or whatever, different techniques will have different effects on colors. Don't get mad at yourself because you try something and it doesn't work. Sometimes you just have to figure out why it didn't work. And then you've learned useful information too. So I'm using the ruddy leather as the next color. So this is, um, well, we'll put some on the palette and we'll see what color it is. Let me just shake it a little more. I meant to shake these before the class and I didn't. So that, looking for one that doesn't have too much stain. So I'll thin it down just a little. I'm going to thin it down more for the wash. But when you thin paint down, you get a better idea of the color too. So it's it's a brown with a little bit of red in it, but it's not vivid. It's a duller color than this orange. So it's darker and a little bit duller. So now how much do I thin it for a wash? Um, and you can use just water for wash if you have problems with like wash rings. Um, you can use either a little bit of flow improver or you can use some brush on sealer and water, or you can use wash medium, which is essentially brush on sealer plus water. So um, both of these are medium or basically it's the binder part of paint. It's the clear part of paint. A wash ring is like, you know what a coffee stain looks like on, on your coffee table? Some people, when they do a wash on a miniature, it's like darker color concentrates on the edges of where they put the wash, which is not what you want. You want it to kind of look even or concentrate in the depressions. So it's, it's one of these problems that not everybody has. I haven't had a lot of problems with it personally, um, but if you have had it as a problem, 
that is annoying. <laughs> so using some of these things will help. All Reaper paints have a little bit of flow improver in it, which maybe is why I don't have a problem because I generally use Reaper paints. Um, the other reason you might like to use brush on sealer is if you find the runniness of washes or glazes annoying to work with, it changes that. But if you're used to the running, if you're used to using the kind of the consistency, you know, how the paint behaves on the palette, you're gonna have to make an adjustment in how you judge whether your washes are good. Because a lot of us probably do something like this. So I had my initial amount of color and I put the, the water, put a bunch of water in and now you can see it falling down from the sides and you can start, you see some of that white color underneath. So I know that it's more transparent because I'm seeing through it. Do I know if it's transparent enough? So that's kind of the big trick with washes. Is it too transparent or transparent enough? And I think I lost my test, but we'll just do it on here. What I often do is use a paper with text on it like this. It's not 100% of a science, but it works. So what I want to do is I want to see color clearly deposited, but I want to see all of the text. This looks like it might be just a little dark to me still. So I'm going to add a little more water. So instead of saying, if I have one drop of paint, how many drops of water do I add? That's not going to work because the way, if you think about your paints when you're doing the base coat and you're trying to paint bright pink and you had to paint five coats of that to make a, a full coverage coat. And then we only had to paint two coats of this color to make a full coverage coat. If I was making a wash out of those two paints, I would have to add less water to that transparent pink than I would have to add to this more opaque orange. So the how many drops thing isn't the right question. The question is how do I want the behave, paint to behave at the end and then test it. So I added a little bit more water. I can see that it's transparent enough that it's going down the sides. So I think that's better. If I ended up getting it wrong, I can do a second coat. I can add a little more paint and do another coat. Um, I generally want to err on the side of being a little more transparent than being a little too opaque, but it's not super critical for a wash. Um, and then washing is not really a precision thing. So I, I don't know that I'd want to go and use like this giant one, but I'm definitely comfortable using this bigger brush because you want to go fairly fast. At least you want to keep your edge going. So um, what I mean by that is I don't want to put a little wash here and then go up here and then go up here and then finish cleaning up here. I kind of want to pick a direction and just keep going in that direction so that kind of my leading edge stays wet and it's okay if the head is starting to dry. So on this figure, I, I did the head um, when, I, you know, when I was doing these washes because he's got this piece of equipment that acts as like a barrier. So his head is really completely separated from the rest of his body in terms of where uh, fluid paint is going to go. So I did kind of all the area that's bounded by that piece of equipment. I did this arm as one section, then the hand is a separate section. Then this arm, you know, if, if you kind of have an edge that dries in an armpit or something, that's a good place to hide it because people, you know, people are going to have to look like this to see the problem. Um, and so I want to divide them up into sections. This, you know, I do the torso to around the belt. And then the tail, I just kind of have to keep going. And as long as the paint is wet, you can still work with it. But depending on the climate where you are, or, you know, if it's still really cold where you are and you're running your heater a lot. So I, I pretty much fully load the brush. I mean, this is if you touch it to something, you know, loose paint is going to come out. This is not the controlled kind of application of a base coat or something else. And then I just start slopping it on. I mean, a wash really is it's not a precision technique. You're trying to get a good amount of the paint all over. That is kind of the trick with this guy. And I noticed even one of the ones that I had done in advance, I missed a little spot. So you want to try to be careful not to miss a little spot. You know, while things are still wet, try to move it around and look at it in different orientations and see if you miss something. So um, I mean, let's see. I think uh, if you have any questions about um, 
doing washes, put that in the chat, but I'm going to do another hair dryer break, I think, in a minute. I'm trying to find the one where I screwed it up. There's a little bit there. So we can see if I can repair it, because what's likely to happen is I'll put the same color on, but you're likely to see the edges somewhere. But now maybe I was hallucinating. But um, I could just put some on one of these just to see what happens. It may or may not show up that much, um, but sometimes it's it you can't put you know once everything dries it's really hard to put the wash on and not get that section. But let me just check my notes and see if I missed something. So brushes, okay. Um, I do generally prefer round brushes for doing um, washes. I don't really think that. I mean, you could use a flatter filbert, but to me, the round works well in terms of you can get a decent amount of paint in there, but you also have some precision in where you're putting the paint when you need it. So we're gonna do hair dryer break so that you guys can get your base coat dry. And then you're gonna, when we come back from that, you're gonna mix your wash. Okay, so hopefully everybody got your, you know, at least some section of your figure is ready for you to apply a wash to. So what I want you to do is take, you know, a dark but not super dark color. So I think it's a few steps down from your middle color, the ready leather if you're using the class colors. Um, hold on just a sec. Uh, and then mix water in until you think it's about the right transparency and then hopefully you have a piece of paper or something you can check test on. Um, it's also, I mean, if you're still learning and you're having a lot of trouble with picking, you know, mixing your washes up so they're not too dark, not too, you know, not too opaque, not too dark, not too transparent, paint a test figure. Like paint, so I have this wing off of, I just repainted this. There were like four different colors on here. Um, paint a test figure and do tests on it. So in this case, I was testing different colors, but I could also use it to test consistency. So don't feel like you just have to know exactly what it is. It's okay if you start doing the wash. If you're comfortable doing it, you may already be familiar with washes. Um, but don't like, knowing the answer isn't always why other people are painting well. Sometimes they're just doing more testing and more thinking about how to figure out the solution. There's a question in chat and I think what they are asking are, are washes okay to dry with a hair dryer or just the spray um, from an airbrush? Let them dry a little bit on their own. So the what I demonstrated to you earlier, I would be comfortable now putting a hair dryer on that. I wouldn't want to use a strong pressure of air. So let it dry a little bit on its own to make sure that it falls into the crevices. But once it's kind of on its way, I do absolutely use a hair dryer on washes. Um, and if you have, so it doesn't matter too much with our snake because it's a very round thing. But if we look at the angel again, another thing that I'll do is I'll do the wash like on this wing and I'll hold it in this orientation for a while to encourage the, the color to concentrate in the crevices. And then once that's kind of mostly dry, it's at the point where I feel comfortable hair drying it, then I'll flip it over and do the other side and let gravity work on the other side. So um, if you can, that is helpful. Because one of the problems you may have had with washes, um, and let's, I think I have to go to photographs for this one. It's in your handout. Uh, yeah, I did. Because this actually is a document camera. So let's look at documents. So um, on this snake, this is just the base coat color of the green. And then this snake is where I put a wash of a darker blue over it. And you can see that it's not falling in every crevice the way I would want it to. And that's just physics. Like that's gonna happen on some figures that the paint isn't going to go where you want it to. 
And your option then becomes to do something I'm going to talk about a little bit later, kind of selective washes where you maybe thin it a little less, or in this case, because it's just crevices, it's not folds of cloth or you know, crevices on you know, depressions in the skin or something, I went back in with a, a fine tip brush and painted those lines in to make sure that they were really well defined. And you, you know, maybe that it doesn't matter to you. It depends on what the point of the figure is. If this, the point of this figure is a five minute encounter in my game, maybe I'm okay with this. I don't need to take an hour or, you know, 20 minutes even or whatever to draw in these little lines. I'm just giving you information for how people are doing some of the stuff that maybe you look at their figures online and you think, oh, that looks super cool. Sometimes the answer is we are painting in the little lines. This is not a wash. There's no magic thing that I'm doing in a wash that makes those lines come out and look perfect and yours don't. Uh, you are not meant to wash the walnut scales. And the, on the walnut scales, we're going to be using a different technique. We'll be going from the darkest color to a lighter color. And then somebody else asked in Q&A, is ready leather going all over the orange parts? Yes. So whatever the brown color is you picked, put it all over the orange parts. So this is what my fully washed guy looks like. If you are a slower painter and you just want to concentrate on a smaller section, you just want to do it on a section right now, that is fine too. So yes, if you look at if you're looking at the class figure and you're wondering why it looks darker in some parts, that's the thing I'm going to do after. That isn't um, something that should be showing up at this stage of what you painted. So hopefully you guys are all doing the wash and having fun with that. Um, let me see if there's. So I showed you that. I showed you that. So yeah, I was, um, I'm, I'm kind of vamping a little to give you guys a little more time to paint too. But I, so I talked about how I did this video and I had a problem. So I painted this snake and I didn't like it. And what the problem is, is that when you do a wash, it does tint everything. So what happened is this color was a, a more red brown than the one that we're using now in class. Um, and that red color showed up everywhere, even in the, the areas that I did more dry brushing on and did more highlights on and stuff. So it can be tricky to choose wash colors. Like I've been painting for 18 years or something and I made this mistake two months ago. So, or a month ago, or whenever we were prepping for this. But I took those same colors and painting using the layering method, that's a great color for a shadow. Um, so, different colors can react differently with different techniques. So as you start trying new techniques, you may um, find that something doesn't work the way you expect or the, the colors don't go together as well as they usually do. It, it, get, it doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong and that you're a terrible painter. It just means that there's a lot of moving parts in what we're doing. And sometimes you have, kind of have to figure out, okay, maybe this color isn't gonna work with this technique and I need to just shift it a little or something like that, or I need to use a different technique. So again, if you wanted to see me talk through my thinking process to help you get an idea of how you do that, that's a video that's up on YouTube. Just look for Bird with a Brush. I only have like seven videos, so it should be easy to find. It's the one with the, with the little preview picture has three of these snakes. Somebody asked if the wash is puddling like in the small of the back of the figure, should they remove some of it? Yeah, if it's really puddling and like you'll find it's going to puddle a lot in kind of these depressions and it's going to take forever to dry. Do the same thing we did if your um, base coat was puddling and just kind of, you know, rinse your brush off until you just have a damp brush and then put it in and then take the excess off and just put it over on your paper towel or something. Especially for now, like if, if you were working at, at leisurely pace at home, you might be able to leave it and just go work on your next figure but um, you'll find that it can take quite a while to dry even with a hair dryer if you don't get some of those puddles out. And then somebody asked what to do with the wash bubbles up. If the wash bubbles, um, that should be easier to pop even you should be able to blow on it gently. I wouldn't use the, the compressed air, at least not until it's dried for a while because that, that thin paint will just blow all over the place. Um, but blow on it a little, tap it with the tip of your brush um, just even try to move, you know, get your, get, make sure you still have some wash on your brush so you're not lifting paint up 
and then just try to move it around. So there, see, I got a bubble. Hopefully you can see the bubble. So I'm just gonna move it around until I get rid of it. So what I don't wanna do is come in with, so there, I don't have paint pooling, so on, and this brush has no paint on it. If I start moving around, you see I'm taking paint off. So the paint is moving onto the brush. And that, that's why if, if you have the correct amount of paint on there, you just have a bubble, make sure you have at least a little bit of paint on your brush so that you're just popping your bubble. You're not um, taking paint off and leaving kind of holes in your um, wash look. So I think, um, I'm glad you like the, the learn to paint kits. I had fun making those. I, I always get a little kick when I see people post one of the pictures up online. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to talking about dry brushing, but it's okay if you guys are still painting washes or if your wash is still drying, and then I'll try to have a hairdryer break before you guys start dry brushing. I mean, if you're ready to go now, you could. Um, but I always think, it's good if you listen a little bit, just to make sure that I'm not doing something. And I don't just mean my class, I mean anyone's class. If Even if you think you know what they're doing next, it's always good to make sure because they might be doing something a little bit differently than you usually do. They may be using terminology differently. So what they mean by a wash is maybe a glaze. So it's good to know, you know, see them demonstrate it and how they use it before you jump in and start doing it. So I'm going to get rid of the messy paint for now at least. So dry brushing, you will need a dry piece of paper towel as or at least hopefully a section of your piece of paper towel is dry. And when we have the hair dryer break, you can run and get one then as well as whatever, you know, you're still going to need to rinse off your brush, but you're going to need a piece of paper towel that's completely dry. The, the dry brushing part name is accurate. Um, so if we go back to the little demonstration idea of this is the texture. So these are the tops of the texture and, and like, you know, you can see that the wash tinted everything. If you compare my original color to the one that has the wash, there's quite a difference there. Even though it's concentrated on those lines in between the scales, it's absolutely also on top of the scales. So before I can put like a light orange or yellow on there, I need to bring back more of this. So the idea of dry brushing is kind of the opposite where in the wash, I want the paint to fall into these crevices as much as possible. With dry brushing, I want the paint to stay on the top of these peaks as much as possible. I don't want to get anything in here where I've got my nice dark shadows defining my scales. I want to try to keep things up here. So some of that is your brush. You will generally find that a flat brush so this is a flat where it has like corners on the edges. And then they call this a filbert or a cat's tongue. So it's a similar idea. It's, well, this one doesn't look skinny from the side, but it kind of is. It's skinny from the side, like a flat brush. But from the main angle, this part is rounded off. I also have some makeup brushes and people on the internet have been going crazy about those. And I got curious enough about it that I went and bought some and I kind of understand what the thrill is. So I'm gonna demonstrate with some different brushes just for your information so that you can decide whether you wanna try different brushes. Um, what would the largest, smallest brushes be that I used? It, that, it's a, temp, depends a little more on what I'm doing. Um, I'm gonna pick a different one actually, he had a bent sword. So in this case, we haven't done anything else. So it's the same, situation where it, I'm fine if I even if I get a little paint on here I can just repaint over this walnut because we haven't done the walnut part yet so I don't feel uncomfortable using a larger brush if I'm getting to the point where I'm working on this little shoulder pad then I might be going down a size of brush but generally speaking larger is a little better for dry brushing than smaller so this is the the reaper 4 uh, flat brush and honestly, this is small. And then there's also the two. So I've included smaller brushes sometimes in the in the learn to paint kits because I know that people who are just starting out kind of prefer really small brushes. But in reality, you will find some tasks are easier with larger brushes. So I will demonstrate. I have I have my spare wing. 
Um, and I'll demonstrate kind of some dry brushing ideas on here. I'm gonna use even the lightest color so that it's easier to see. The one thing about using a lighter color is it's gonna be harder to see on here. So I'm gonna start with um, kind of the paper towel test. And one thing you can do, I think I put it somewhere. If you got those blue shop towels, if you wanna dry brush white, that, that's something you can do to try to see that. So I'm gonna start with um, Numeria, Numeria rust just to show you how you load the brush and stuff so again i'm not thinning my paint i don't thin paint for dry brushing it is dry brushing so adding water often complicates your life there may be situations where you would i've lost my lid but i don't need it so there it is so i'm gonna put the lid like this so that you can also see my paper towel at the same time so the, the brush itself was pretty dry. Um, I'll show you what to do if it's not. So you get a good amount of paint on there. You're not really looking to get it way up to where the metal part is. It may happen, but that's not really what you're looking to. This is the wing from the Griffin. And then you're gonna get a lot of that paint off. And I always try to kind of tamp the tip because we'll find a lot of paint concentrates there. So now you can see right there, hopefully, I'm leaving a little bit of color. In fact, I've almost done too much. So when you, if you have a lot on your brush in particular, so it's gonna kind of fill in the color. Then as you wipe more, you're going to not fill in the depressions where the paper towel is. That's how you start knowing that your brush is loaded, right? Now this color is the same color as the wick, so I'm not gonna use that color, but it figured it would show up on the paper towel better. Um, I think if you put the paint right on the paper towel, you're going to be losing some paint because it's going to soak into the paper towel, so it's a little wasteful. It'll also dry out quicker because the point of a paper towel is to soak up water. I don't think it's necessarily going to be a problem. Um, this is just more efficient for me. Like if, if I had paint left over from painting my mid my mid tone, particularly if it was on a wet palette and was still viable paint, I, I start using that and then just dispense more paint if I need to. So I don't think you're necessarily gonna do anything wrong or have a weird result, but I think you're gonna use a lot more paint than you would otherwise. So I rinsed this brush out and now it's very wet. So I, I, I mean, I have a towel off to the side that I'm just kind of doing, doing the general rinsing on, but I kind of pinch them if I'm, if I'm continue, yes, when, when you do the dry brushing, you will start with the Numeria orange. I'm going to use a lighter color because I didn't put a wash on the wing just so that you can see the dry brushing and test different brushes. So if you feel comfortable proceeding, you can. If you want to wait a little bit, I think you're okay to wait a little bit. But use the Numeria orange if you start um, dry brushing on your snake man. All right, so I'm going to, instead of going to the next color, I'm going to go to the lightest color so that you can see this really well. And we'll try some different brushes so you can get an idea of how some different brushes um, react. If you don't have one of these paint poker things and you don't buy the box, this comes in the hobby box, I think, um, you can use a uncoiled um, paper clip or a T-pin, hat pin, something like that. It's just, you can get a little paint that dries in there or there can be a little plastic flap. Never squeeze harder, that is not the answer. <laughs> Many people have found this out to their peril. All right, so just to be clear, this is for demonstration, don't do this on your figure. I'm doing this so that you can see the dry brushing and how the different brushes work really well. This is not for the figure. That's why I have something that is not our figure. This is the wing off of Griffin. So I'm gonna start with the, and remember this is the larger of the, the Reaper flats. So what you should see is that it's building up on the upper areas of the feathers, but in between where the crevices are. And it's gonna look weird because this is a much lighter color than I should be doing this with. We haven't done the middle step. But you can see it's also taking me a while and I already have to reload. 
Now, one thing to note, I'm using a fairly gentle motion. I, I would have no qualms about doing this on my skin. Um, I like to say, think of, think of yourself as Indiana Jones and you're dusting off the artifact. There are scrubbing types of dry brushing. It's worth um, exploring different techniques and different brushes and stuff to see what works for you. But I prefer, it's nicer on the brush. It's, um, you know, less stressful, I guess, I don't know. So I prefer a gentler stroke if, if I can make that work with the figure and the brush that I have. So let's just go all the way to the opposite. So this is a makeup brush. I assume this is for eye makeup. I don't know. Um, I bought a big set off Amazon, but you should be able to go to like Target or something like that. There's a brand called Elf. They're pretty inexpensive. Elf like elves. Um, I do like the Filbert or this dome style uh, better than a flat, I think. So it looked like, so first of all, I mean, you saw me, it's like, oh my gosh, that's sucking up a ton of paint, but I could probably do this whole wing with that. I may not have gotten enough off even. So you, it's a much, it's not as harsh a look um, and it gets some of the detail a little better. And you can see how long that one, like I might have to reload once but it's a pretty efficient thing. And depending on the colors you pick and how adept you are at handling the brush, you know, and you can practice this. I've been doing dry brushing on smooth surfaces like cloth and not being totally unhappy with it using this style of brush. And I was not able to get that to successfully work with the, um, the, the standard flats. These have, um, the, let me see if I can doing this before in a class. So there's there's a little pushback, like it's still a softer brush, but there's a little bit of pushback where this is a floppy soft bristle. And I think that's part of what makes it work. Now, the annoying thing about all of these kinds of flat brushes is that the paint, there is all kinds of that yellow paint in here now, where the round I was using to paint on the base coat color and do the wash, that rinsed out pretty well. But these, as soon as this class is over, these brushes are gonna get brush cleaner. I do, do not spend a lot of time cleaning my fancy Kalinsky sables. These are the brushes that I spend a lot of time cleaning. Um, Cause that once, if enough paint gets up there and you don't get it out, it's gonna stiffen up and the brush won't work right the next time you go to use it. So let's try one more. Let's try this big round. And this is a fairly, kind of in the middle here. It's not quite as stiff as the flat was because it's round. So I think the hair is pretty similar, but the shape of the brush makes it a little different. Oh, and you definitely have to pinch these guys. So now that I rinsed it, if I was switching to a different color, I would have to pinch this a bunch between dry paper towel. And I'm looking, I'm trying to check if it's damp with my fingers too when I do this and drying off thing. And it, the problem with the round is it's harder to keep hairs out of the crevices. So it's that this brush is big enough that it's not impossible, but it just, I don't know. It's just not a very efficient tool for the job. Like I'm getting a lot on the edges, but I'm having trouble getting in the middle, but then in other places I'm, you know, I'm getting light colored paint up in the crevice there. So, experiment with what the brushes you have, or if you see like a cheap brush at the craft store and you want to give it a shot, it doesn't hurt to experiment. But my experience has been that flats or like the filbert or dome style brushes are pretty nice for dry brushing. So now I will do it on my actual snake. Oh, I'll keep that there actually. Needs to have to... So where is my actual snake? So I do not want that round brush. This, I mean, if you feel like this is a little big, they have smaller brushes too, but things that are small, when the hairs start getting like shorter, sometimes it's stiffer. So it may not work exactly the same as these bigger fluffy ones. And this is actually the small, this is one of the smaller brushes from my set. It had some, if I painted tanks, I would be really well set up right now. Uh, but alas, I do not. So I just have some giant brushes that I probably won't get to use that often. So I'm gonna make sure this one is dry. 
and then paint on the actual snake and it's totally not. So you can also, you know, with these bigger fluffier brushes, you can test it against your skin to see if you still feel moisture. This doesn't have to be like bone dry. You just don't wanna add water to your paint because you're more likely to get streaks. And a streaky look is generally not what you want for dry brushing. So now that I'm painting on my actual figure, I'm going back to that first color that we painted, the Numeria Rust or whatever your mid-tone color is. And I'm trying to bring back some of that color. So I, was, I wanna keep the definition between the scales that we got here, but I wanna bring back some of this color before we go to lighter colors. And actually, I'm, I'll do this part silently. We'll put the we'll put the hair dryer thing. So I'll work silently for a minute so you can watch me. But if you need to dry some of your wash off, this will give you an opportunity to do it. Okay, hopefully uh, everyone's finished with their hair dryer because I wanna, I like to do at least a little bit on screen with you guys because it helps me remember things that I might not think about mentioning. So one of the things that um, I want to mention is this initial color, we want to go everywhere because we want to bring that metal color back up everywhere. Um, with the subsequent lighter colors, we're gonna apply them a little more selectively. Um, there may be places where the area is smaller and I would need to get a smaller brush. So I, I got in the hand okay. I think I can get in the fingers. Um, it's not as much for this initial pass, but still think about it a little maybe. We're gonna assume that the light is coming down from above. So if I kind of move the brush in the direction of the light, I'm gonna leave more paint on higher up surfaces and kind of mimic what the light would be doing. And then these are bones. So if you need to move something out of the way a little. Now with the Bones USA, I would be carefuler with that, but um, with original bones, that's one of the things I like about it is that you can do that. So as people are dry brushing, feel free to let me know if you have questions. This initial step, I guess, isn't the trickiest part because you know what color you're using. You're using whatever color you started with. Um, now, if you went, say you did go a little too dark, you know, if you if you did the walnut and, and your guy got really dark, what you could do is kind of make a in-between, you know, start with this color for your dry brushing and then work back up. It might not look amazing, but um, you can kind of mix a half and half or something to kind of get a step and then, so that's what happens if you don't take enough paint off. Uh, if you can see down there on his snake butt, I mean, he doesn't really have a butt, but where the butt would be if he was not a snake, I have filled in the dark lines between the crevices. So I went over where the wash is. And that was because I was, um, not folk, you know, I pressed a little too hard and I didn't get enough paint off my brush. Now, because it's in his snake butt area, um, one of the things we're gonna do in a minute should hopefully cover that up.
the dry brushing does use a little bit of paint because you have to get some of it on and then get some of it off. And I, I do often, um, even if this, as this paint dries, it becomes a less absorbent surface. So I will kind of only use my dry brushing cloth or paper towel so far, and then I'll keep this and use it for just general brush blotting until it becomes too coated with paint to soak up much at all. So I don't know if he's 100%, but I think I'm going to call him good so I can show you guys the next stage. You keep taking your time on yours if you need to. From this point, we shouldn't really need the hair dryers. Um, well, we might do one more step where we need hair dryers, but I don't think so. Um, because that's the nice thing about dry brushing. The paint is pretty close to dry. So like almost as soon as you put it down on the figure, it's dry to the touch. I will take this moment just to mention a PSA I've been trying to share with people. Uh, when we say the paint is dry, we mean you can paint over it. So that it's touch dry um, is what they would call that in kind of the paint industry or whatever. Full cure. So when a paint is all of the water has evaporated and that coat of paint is as tough as it's ever going to be, even on acrylic paints, thin paints like this is one to two days. So your paint isn't full strength for handling for at least a day after you paint it. So if you want to have a super sturdy paint job on your figures, you want to leave them, you know, you don't want to paint him today and then have everybody putting their grubby Cheeto fingers all over him tonight at tonight's game. Now, sometimes that's just going to happen. It's nature of the beast. But if you can, you leave it a couple of days for the paint to dry. And then if you're going to put sealer on, you leave a couple of days after the sealer to dry. All right, so that is the initial color. Back Somebody asked, when here. is a good time to clean up spots? The dry brushing doesn't seem to hit. There are awkward patches left over. So there's kind of spots that are a little too dark. Um, if it's spots that are a little too dark, I would. that's when I would go in, like get, see if you can get a smaller brush. You may even need a round brush um, and, and try to get into those little areas if you can. So, you know, maybe under here uh, would be a place that it would be hard for your, your uh, dry brush to go. So I do the same thing, but I'm trying to apply it with a little more precision and make sure that I got all the spots. And I'm not wearing my close-up glasses. So, so I may not have gotten all the spots on him. Your first dry brush layer that goes all over the figure after you've done the wash is the original color you painted, Numeria Rust. So you're restoring some of that orange color to the tops of the, the scales and leaving the darkest color just in the crevices is the goal of this step of dry brushing. Any subsequent steps of dry brushing you take past here, the goal is to add highlights and pop and bring out the dimensions of the figure a little more. So if I can, I'm going to be thinking about where that light idea. I'm not going to put this next any of this next lighter colors in this darker. So, you know, if you see where, what I was calling his snake butt, let's see if we can kind of see that. That is a, like, you know, if the sun's coming down here, there's no sun reaching. Let's try them from this side. There's no sun reaching under there. The sun can't get there. Where the sun don't shine, you don't put highlights. Same thing. I mean, we're not, we're painting these belly scales a different way, but same thing, I wouldn't put any dry brushing there if I were doing it with dry brushing um, under the arms, places like that. I'm just going to leave it where it is now and apply these lighter colors to areas like the top of his head, the top of his shoulders, the top of his snake butt, the top of the tail, stuff like that. And that next lighter, they don't have butt cheeks, but I mean, he could sit down clearly, so he's kind of got a snake butt. And then somebody um, asked how to avoid the dry brush uh, looking chalky. So it's streaky or chalky. So streaky is you have too much water, too much paint or too watery of paint on the brush and you need to wipe a little more or make sure your brush is drier before you put paint on it. 
um, chalky. I, if you have chalkiness from this step, so I, I don't know if you're talking about in general or if you mean right now you got chalkiness during this step because you probably shouldn't have chalkiness yet. Chalkiness is more likely to happen um, if I went straight from this color to this color, it would probably look chalky. So this, this well, that's what I did here actually. So we don't have the wash, but I went straight from the Numeria Rust to NM Gold Highlight. And it looks a little chalkier. You're more aware of the blotchiness of the dry brushing because I jumped up too quickly in color. So if you take your color in more steps, that helps. Um, not just mixing in white, kind of instead of mixing white into this for each of my subsequent colors up, picking a color that's a little bit richer and has less white in it. And then maybe if I really wanted to go light, I could put white on top of this. But if I mix white and, and this color, I don't think I have any white with me. Um, sure, we'll call this white. Primer, but we'll call it white. For now. So the color I'm having you put on next after this orange is this color. So I'm going to take our original Numeria Rust and mix a little bit of white with it, and it the color is going to not look as good, and it wouldn't be more likely to look chalky in dry brushing. So you see how that's a much duller color than the saffron. And white itself is more likely to look chalky. So trying to avoid white until the very end stages is one way to avoid chalkiness. Um, don't like make your brush super dry and scrub. That's where the Indiana Jones style on dusting off the artifact will help too, I think. Because if you're really scrubbing, you're literally kind of, you know, sometimes when you're dry brushing, if you look closely, if you look at it with magnification, you can see little particles of paint kind of coming off the miniature that it literally is dusty. Um, if you are using a softer stroke, you can hopefully avoid that a little. So like I said, we're going to use this color now, which is the Saffron Sunset. Or if you're picking your own colors or mixing your own colors, you don't want your lightest color. You want something in between your middle color and your lightest color. So I've picked this orange in that case. I'm still going to go ahead and use the big brush now, but I'm going to try to use more control about where I put it. So like I said, I'm not going to put it where his body is folding under. I'm not going to, I'm going to try and you know just use this stroke. So instead of kind of going down the side, I'm going to keep the brush on the top and have the brush then the paint, where the paint ends up should sort of simulate how the light works. So I definitely, you know, if the light's coming from above, there's definitely going to be a lot of, so you see I'm using like a light touch there and there may be a little too much paint on here. I don't know how to show you how light it is. Do it on a brush maybe. Just that, I'm barely even moving the tip of a brush. But when I say a light stroke, that's what you want the texture to pull the paint off the brush, not to be scrubbing the paint into the texture. But I'm not going to go under his neck. This is a lighter color. It's where the sun is shining. I don't know why he doesn't want to stay. So I definitely want to get the top of his shoulders and kind of accent the muscles. A little bit of top of that arm. But I don't need to go into his armpit. There's not a lot of sun shining on his armpit. And snakes don't normally have those, but this particular snake does. I do want to get where that um, coil of his body is moving out there and maybe just a little bit the top of the shoulder blades there, which again, snakes don't normally have. So just the idea that if I put all of this color all over, it's and then I put all of my lightest color all over, it's going to end up looking like this, and that is going to look chalky too. So that's another problem that causes chalkiness, is if you put all of your highlight colors all over the exact same areas, you're essentially putting your lightest color on your middle color, and you, you barely even see 
the colors in between. So if I put all three of these colors over the exact same locations, I really just jumped from this to this and, and this isn't visible in what I did. Um, well, by paint too dry, I kind of meant the, if, if you're scrubbing hard, like if, if paint it stops coming off, instead of scrubbing, go reload your brush. And every now and then, even though we are dry brushing, like the paint that is in there right now is drying. So I'm gonna have to rinse out my brush and clean it out and dry it and get new paint. Or I'll be applying both the fresh wet paint and the dried up paint that's in my brush. So that's another thing that could be causing a chalky look. So if, if you know, I'm fine, paint isn't coming off, it's dry. So I could scrub and I would get some paint off, but that paint is more likely to look chalky. It might not every time, but it's more likely to look chalky than if I didn't do that. I'd be better off getting fresh paint or even now, since I've been sitting talking about this for a minute, it's probably time to clean out my brush and you know try to get out some of that old gunky paint and get fresh paint. So here's what he looks like with the second stage of dry brushing done now. And I, you know, cause I was demonstrating to you, I didn't hundred percent leave this area, the, the middle color. It's fine, we'll, we'll do some stuff later or I just live with it. But now I'm gonna do one more layer with this lightest color. And there I'm gonna apply it even more sparingly. And if I were concerned that I might over apply it, then maybe now is the time when I go down to a smaller brush so that I can have a little more control and be careful about it. So you can try to do it with the control of your hand, or you can try to do it with the control of what size and type brush you pick, or you can try and do like a combo. And over time, you may find that you can shift from having to use smaller tools or something like that to being able to control more of it yourself. So as you get to the lighter color, it's gonna be a little harder to check it on the paper towel because it's a lighter color, and particularly if it's white. You can kinda, I mean, I, I don't necessarily wanna recommend people paint themselves, but we have little crevices in our skin. So you can sometimes tell, I mean, if you're as pasty as me, it doesn't help much more than a paper towel. But you can sometimes tell doing it on yourself or like maybe that's when you want to have a test wing. So I can just test my load of paint so that I'm not accidentally ruining my figure. Blue paper towel, the blue shop towel is another option. But I, I had some and then I don't know what I did with it. So since this is the lightest color and I really kind of just want it for effect, I'm going to be much more careful about where I put it. So I want it on top of his head. I want people to pay attention to his little snake face. We'll put a little bit there on his arms. But I, I definitely don't want any under here. Like this is not an interesting area of the figure that I want you looking at a lot. Maybe just a little here to emphasize the curve. And I keep gonna come to the back, do a little bit on the back of his neck. Make sure I get the top of his shoulders in this angle. I don't want to come over here at all. If you look at him, you know, you think about where the light is, that part's dipping in, but this um, coil is sticking out a little bit. So I'll put some of that highlight there. And then these coils are definitely sticking out. So I won't put that highlight there. Make it more interesting from the back too. So I didn't actually get, um, I didn't actually get much of my, even my middle color back there, but I didn't get the in-between color. So if I put that there, it's gonna look a little weird and that will give you a nice example of how, of a sudden jump where you use that in-between color. And you see it gets faster. So even though I'm using more steps and you could use, you know, four steps instead of three steps or five steps. Um, and the more steps you use, kind of the more refined of a result you're gonna get, I think. The, this example, I think I used four steps. Um, and that's up to you of what is the function of the figure, how much time you have, how much do you enjoy doing this. But that's one of the things, if you're seeing people that get kind of a, a smoother looking result or a less, um, I'm not sure how to put it exactly, less choppy looking result, 
um, that's the kind of thing they may be doing is using more steps in between. And it gets faster because I'm putting the paint on fewer areas. I'm pretty much done the top highlights. If I, I wouldn't go up to white on him, I don't think. I think that that's more than enough contrast on the highlights. We're gonna use more contrast in the shadows now. But um, if I did for some reason wanna go up to white, that would be going in an even smaller area, just really like key points to help it jump up. So hopefully that part makes sense. If you have any questions about kind of selectively dry brushing, you know, choosing where you're putting the color a little bit more to make those highlights reflect the, what the light source would be doing or even just general dry brushing questions, please let me know. Um, and I will go on to the shadowing part. So I, if, if anyone's like panicked and needs a minute to catch up, I guess let me know that too, but I wanna make sure we get, um, so we have a half hour, I think 35 minutes left. So we may not have a ton of time on the body scales, but I wanna make sure we get to at least this next section, which is I'm gonna go back to washes a little bit. So the first wash we applied was all over everything. You don't have to apply a wash all over everything. There's kind of, I mean, it, what I'm talking about is really layering, but it's kind of like a bridge between layering and doing washes, I guess. Um, so I've been calling it selective washes. So I want to add some more shadows. So if we look at, what am I? So this is the, the one the, where I painted up to in class. And this was kind of the one that I did as my test figure. So what do you see as the main differences between these? Um, and the answer is that there are more areas of darkness. So I use the wash to pick out the scale texture. I'll get to your question in just a sec. So I use the wash to pick out the scale texture, but I didn't rely on the wash to add all of my shading. I went in and added selective washes to add more shading. So that's the part I'm gonna show you right now. Um, I actually would paint his arms the same color. I just might use the layering technique in areas where the scales aren't. Just because I think it, to me, I, I first of all, I want to be more efficient and quicker. Um, but also, uh, to me, aesthetically speaking, I think that's still scaled. It's just in scale. The scales are the scale texture is so small we're not seeing it. So I, to me, I don't envision those as flesh. I envision it as a smoother scale texture. If you envisioned it as flesh, and this is where you get into more of an art thing, it's what color would you want to paint them? You could paint them kind of a, a ruddy orange, flat, like I mean, like a human equivalent of someone you think of as a ruddy color. You could paint them that and think that's the underlying skin color. I don't, I mean, do snakes have skin under the scales? That's another thing I would do is I'd probably go look up what, what does snake skin look like under scales? Like if you look at a cat, if you've ever had a cat get shaved to have an operation or something, the skin often has the same pattern as the fur. So if you've got a cat with like spots, they'll have dark spots of the skin and then light spots where the fur is lighter. So the, the skin matches, there we go. There's no skin under scale. So I would stick with my, I'm going with the scale color. Um, but like for an animal, the skin, some animals, the skin color matches the fur color. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I, I've studied some stuff from the scale modeling community and they have a lot of things that they um, can teach us or that we can learn from them. So it's always valuable. I do study some stuff from the historical community. So my original wash, I could start with just that, especially now, you know, it's dried just a little bit. So I could start with just that and come in and put another coat in but it's a little thin maybe. For some parts, let, let's try it here. So if I wanna do this little subtle part, it will probably work well for that. Now what I'm gonna do is, so I just rinse my brush off, it's just damp. I'm gonna go around the edges and wipe that off. Um, it probably won't matter for the scales, but if you wanna try this um, technique with something that has a robe, that I don't have an example of with me at the time, um, 
you're more likely to see where the wash leaves off if you start doing this technique. So um, just give me one sec to see if I can find a figure that has some tape on it. <laughs> Yeah, this won't work. I think this is dark enough. So if I wanted to do this selective wash thing and try to do something like this, where I'm making this, the crevice a little darker, this was layering, but this really is similar to layering. So I could come in like this. If I'm worried about that line showing right there, so I just rinse my brush off, I'm just gonna wipe down that line and it should um, make the transition a lot softer. So that's the same thing I'm gonna do on the snake. Uh, you just don't have to worry about it as much on something that has a lot of texture because um, the texture is going to break up where that line is and people's eyes won't see it as well. So it's not that the line isn't there, it's just that the eye isn't going to see it. So the other place I might put some of this is kind of along this bottom edge of all the snake coils to make it look more round. So where things get darker, where they move away from us, then it's going to look more round. And I really don't even need to clean it up that much. So even just that little bit has added more dimension to him. There aren't a lot of places I would add it on the front. I mean, maybe a little bit under the arms, under the neck. People are asking what color you're using for this. Uh, this is the original watching. wash that we use. This is the ruddy brown, ruddy leather, ruddy brown. Um, yeah, the ruddy leather. So this was the original wash that I mixed up that I showed you that I still had good. If you if yours still isn't um, wet enough to use, you can just mix up a little more. If I was finding that this wasn't having as much of an effect, I would probably just add a little more paint. So I could make up a fresh one, or I could just add a little paint on the side and then pull it in. If I put it right in here, I don't get to control it as much. So if I put it over here on the side and then mix it in, I can kind of check and do my test again and make sure that I didn't make it too opaque. And that, you know, that might be enough. You might be happy with that. I mean, I think he looks all right, actually. I did go back on and test one. So you look at it again, they're more similar, but there's still some differences because I actually made a walnut wash on this guy. So we're running a little late on time. I'll demo that real quick, but don't feel like you have to do this because you can come do this part later since it's not, we're not doing anything else to those areas after this. So it'd be okay if you don't do even the, the ruddy leather um, or a darker selective wash. If you wanna wait on a selective wash thing until later, um, feel free because we're not doing anything else in those sections. We're gonna go to the big belly scales after this. So this is a pretty potent color. You can see I'm not, even though I added some water and I'm not really seeing the sides of the palette through there as much. So I might have to add more water than I did on the ready leather to get it to be transparent or semi-transparent. And I would do my, and this, I really do this. For washes and glazes, I really do this test. Layering and stuff like that, I can usually tell on the palette whether I, whether the paints at the right consistency. But that's pretty good. I mean, it's a much darker color, so it's gonna affect it a bit more. And then I'm I'm not gonna put that everywhere. The same idea with the highlights. Um, I'm gonna mostly concentrate in the really, the areas that are not getting light from the sun so that they would be shadowed. So with this thinned paint, when you wanna be more controlled, um, and I always forget to mention this because this is how automatic this is. Sure, I dipped my brush in there and I got a whole bunch on like when we did the first washes, but then I took some of it off because I don't want it to go everywhere. I, it's a selective wash. I just want it to go where I want it to go. So I'm putting it in that crowd. I'll put just a little bit right here, but then I am probably going to want to rinse off my brush and just feather out that edge a little bit. And then I think I want it on the rings where they're facing, or the, the coil of his body where it's facing towards the ground. And I might do that same thing where I rinse it out and just soften the edge a little bit. And if I come up here and do it there, it's gonna add some definition. 
and that'll add like a lot more dimension and bring out the, the shapes of the figure a lot more. So hopefully that part makes sense. Um, again, feel free to, you know, skip this part and not try until later if you um, are concerned about time. So the next thing I'm going to kind of give you a macro, what we're going to do is try and paint these little streaks. For this, you will want to try to have a brush with a better tip. And I will again experiment on my guy and show you a few different brushes. So I'm going to, I'll try with my, my number two, my number zero. And then this is um, a Kalinsky Sable with a nicer tip. It's not a perfect tip, but it's a nicer tip. But I want to show you kind of the concept of doing those little streaks or striations kind of large scale first. This space under there, let's see. Okay, so this is a little darker than our walnut, but it's pretty similar. And these aren't exactly the same colors, but they're kind of similar. So the idea is we're gonna be painting little lines, but you're not trying to be super precise and worry about where they are. And we're gonna kind of go from darkest to lightest. So first I'll draw like this is the area of the scale, say. So I'm gonna to wanna to leave some of it this original color. So I'll start with my, and I'll just be doing this with my brush. It's not super precise. If I go back over a section, that's fine. Just this general idea of streakiness. And I come in with my next lighter color and it's like I was talking about with the highlighting. I don't wanna cover everything I did before. I want some of that stuff underlined to show through. I come with my next one. And again, I'm moving to a smaller area. So I'm just kinda of gonna do this section. Oops, I'm not quite in frame. And then my very lightest color, similar thing. I'm moving to an even smaller area. And I might do a line across the whole bottom edge or something like that. So that's the idea, but we're gonna be using a brush and paint instead of crayons. So let me know if that part didn't make sense. That's the best way I figured out how to demonstrate that kind of sticky thing is with the crayons, because it's nice and big, so you can see it. So it, even in my in-person class, that is how I demonstrate doing those sort of streaks. So that's the finished guy, we don't want him. There's Mr. In, in current progress. So for this one, I'm just gonna put out color, we'll do it this way, sort of from darkest to lightest. I'm not gonna put out any walnut if you, well, I'll put it out just so we know what the darkest color is. But mainly I would only use that if, if my other color was applied too broadly or I needed to bring back some streakiness, I might come in with that. I will be using the color full strength out of the bottle. I'm not adding water or anything. So I'm using our five colors that we used on the other scales, but because we're applying them from light to dark, you'll get a different sort of effect. Now, if you were painting this at home and you wanted to pick a more contrasting color, you want to do like a greeny brown or something like that, um, that would probably be very visual effective. I was just trying to pick a set of paints where I could do both things with it so you didn't have to go have a whole bunch of other colors too. So in the real world, if I were doing this, I might be picking slightly different colors just to make it interesting. So I will start with the Reaper Zero. I, this is one of those areas where I generally prefer to use a real natural hairbrush. Reaper has those black handle brushes. I'm going to do it on these larger ones. Hopefully it's in focus. I am in frame. So I'm thinking about that light thing too. I might not even paint these bottom ones very much. You know, I might just paint a little bit on the edges like that and do a little bit on the edge overall. But that, you know, if you look at where the light is, the sun don't shine. So it doesn't need a lot of highlighting down there. Um, So I'm not getting, you know, it's kind of filling in more than making lines because it's this big brush. Well, this isn't even a big brush. I did the zero instead of the one. Um, and this is why I don't love that type of brush. 
for this sort of work. Um, I thought I had picked out a couple of small detail brushes too, but I don't see them. If you have, the thing that happens to me with um, synthetic brushes is they all eventually, well, and by eventually, I mean 10 minutes after I start, start to hook a little at the end and that makes drawing those little lines really hard. So you saw kind of how rough it looks. Also, let, we, yeah, we're starting with the ready leather. Um, but if you wanna watch me for a minute and see you know, what kind of brush you might wanna try it with so that your guy is consistent all over, which my guy will not be. I'm gonna paint in some places I wouldn't otherwise in terms of the light because these scales are bigger than these scales and you're gonna be able to see it better. So I can get a much more controlled result. with the um, sable brush. And this one is actually a slightly worn out sable brush, I think. So there are things I literally cannot do without certain kinds of brushes. Um, I don't know if you can see that the paint is just a little bit shiny, which means it's still wet. You do want to leave some walnut brown. It's like the, the demo scale. So you want to leave some walnut brown along the crevice and along the side, whatever side isn't getting a lot of light. So as soon as it's not shiny anymore and I'm reasonably confident it's dry, if you're going through and doing like four or five scales at a time or you do all of the one color and then come back, it dries off really quickly and now it's fine too. So now I'm going up to the Numeria Rust and that's gonna be in an even smaller area. I don't wanna go exactly over where I did all the other parts or I'm gonna, it's gonna be like I went straight from, you know, this to this. If I, if I cover over all of this, it's like I'm going straight from that color to that color. And I actually think I went too subtle when I did it on my on my test guy. I think it looks better with a little more. You want to see the streaks a little. You want to see the lines. You want you don't want to thin your colors or have them too close together. So and it dries pretty quick when you're oops. So what happened just there is I had a drop of paint on my ferrule and this happens to me all the time and then it slid down and it got in this paint. So this is now actually wash consistency paint even though I didn't plan for it to be. In this particular case, it's not in the main bubble but I kind of have to watch for that. So I, if I pull the paint from there, it's gonna be too thin. And it's, well, in fact, let's try it. Um, so it probably won't show up well enough. And then it makes a liar of me, but uh, <laughs> saffron sunset is a pretty good color. But I will try taking it from here instead. So the other thing I'm doing is now that I, if I'm painting a base coat, I don't care if there's like, a, you can probably see there's a blob of paint there on the end. I don't care about that on a base coat. I do care about it if I'm trying to make precision work or do fine lines. So I'm trying to get a lot of the paint off. I actually, I don't use paper towel. I use the sponge and you can see there's paint all over it. So it, it's damp um, and I'll dip my brush in there and then I dip here. It almost never am I going straight from my palette to my figure. It almost always stops here. The wash, you do want like a big bloop of paint. So that's like one of the few cases where I would go straight to the figure. But this, and then you'll often, if, if you get a chance to go to a live convention or you know watch people on stream or whatever, you'll often see them do stuff like that too. So even they may be more precise painters than I am where they get just a little, you know, they do that. I'm not that kind of painter. Some people are, but I'm not. I, I instead I go, and then I get a lot of that paint off. But you will often see them do something like this where they're on the base or on a part they haven't finished the figure yet, they're testing whether the amount of paint on the brush is an amount of paint they can control, whether the consistency is correct and whether it's an amount of paint they can control. So now that I'm up to the second lightest color, I'm going just in a small section. And this, this is not correct for the lighting. Um, this is 
these were the best scales for demonstration purposes. And what I might do, instead of using the very lightest color, I might do it with the lightest color, I might not, is so each of those scales is overlapping like that, right? I want to get a little lightness on this one that's overlapping this. So I'm going to take the side of the brush and kind of try to drag it along the edge and get the paint off that way. This is a brush control thing. So if you don't feel comfortable, edging is usually what they call it. If you don't feel comfortable, don't do this because it's really easy to get that light color paint. And I do that by accident. And I get light color paint in what I want to be the darkest crevice. So this is kind of, the edge of a cloak or something, it's easier to do because there's nothing else there. So I would recommend practicing on something like that first. So this is a lot easier to do. It's kind of, you think of it's like a cross. So I want my brush to be perpendicular to my um, edge. And then I draw it along and the edge pulls off the light color. Let's do it even with the lightest color. You can see it better. So I would practice on something like cloak edges or something like that where you don't have anything right where the brush tip is going to go by accident. Scales are hard mode for edging. And I'll do it with the very lightest color. Just like even th this one would be hard even with a good brush and kind of knowing what I'm doing. This one would be hard to do just the way it's sculpted. And I think I did like it with the slightly lighter color there. I mean, the slightly darker color. So that's the idea between the streak thing. You're, it, it doesn't matter if you're not trying to go over the exact same line or anything like that. It's just an overall impression of striations. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I think that's all the main parts I wanted to show you. And I think I actually like the, you know, you can, you can be very subtle with this depending on the kind of texture you're getting, but I think I actually like the bolder look on the one I just showed you guys. Then I, I was using a finer brush and being a little more subtle on the test one I did. And I like this better. This is going to be more effective on a tabletop or even on a contest uh, display shelf because you got to get the judges you got to get the judges at eye level before they um want to look at it closer up how would i place the highest highlight on the vertical scales do you mean like the where he's standing straight up and down like his chest area um i'd be concentrating them towards the edges so if we this one's fairly vertical um so instead of kind of getting you know from darker to lighter in that direction, I'd be getting darker to lighter in this direction. And I'll do just a little bit of that section. If you hear a sad cat in the background, I apologize. She's used to being able to bother me while I paint and have attention. And she does not understand when there's videos or not. And if I end up getting it too far up and I lose that line, I can bring that dark line back in after. It's a correctable problem. So I and now I am trying to go just a little bit lower down. And it's gonna it's gonna be harder to get all of that range. Like you're gonna have some, you're gonna have more overlap with the colors. But you're hopefully still have sort of the same impression. And then let's say I did go too far up. So I can take my darkest color. I had that little water drop on there again. And then just try to, where we have sculpted detail like this and you're doing a line or lining as we often call it, um, hold the brush against the upper sculpted detail. So if I was lining between his gauntlet and his arm, I'm gonna be holding the brush in that, like pushing the brush a little bit in this direction so that I'm making as controlled a line as possible in this direction. So I'm using that as a guideline. Sure, let me get the crayons. 
through, which is paper, so we don't want wax. Okay, as soon as I figure out what I do with the friends. So let's we'll say this is a vertical scale. So it's on his app, like his chest area. So instead of you know concentrating the darkness to one side and then moving over, I'm concentrating the darkness at the top because the scale is going to be flaring out a little. And then concentrating the lighter colors towards the bottom. And on the small ones, kind of by the time you get very light, you are effectively just drawing that line along the edge on, on the, if the scales are very narrow. And then you might come back and maybe you don't even do that all over the whole edge. You just pick a part and do it. So you can kind of apply it like this, but for a lot of people, it's going to be easier to try to just do that. So any other daily questions or um, issues that have been coming up for you while you've been painting or trying these things or you've tried other scale stuff? We've got, I think, about 10 minutes left for questions or comments or if there's something you need me to demonstrate again, I can try to do that. Um, it, how big are the scales in that scenario? I mean, if the scales start being a certain size, I'm more likely to do something like the striation technique or plain layering. But that also depends on like, what is your goal? Is your goal to win a contest? Is your goal to make paint something that looks really good in a photograph? Or is your goal to get a dragon on the table for next week? that's also gonna influence my decision. It's like, how much time do I have? Um, and how much do I care what the result looks like? So you absolutely can use, um, let me go get the, the crazy brushes that are in my set. I don't know, I think I put them somewhere. Hold on, why did I go? No, maybe not. But um, if, you're, if you've never seen makeup brushes, this, this is a small one. The big one, the head of it's like this in comparison. So I could totally dry brush dragon scales with the big suckers from my makeup brush set. Um, the streakiness and the chalkiness may become more apparent if I'm using dry brushing on big scales like that. Um, so that's why I might be looking at other techniques, but any other technique is gonna take you some time. Oh, thanks. I'm glad that you like the, the uh, Linda Pink kits. Somebody I asked, wish there, um, there was more I could put in there. I'm sorry. Somebody asked in Q&A, uh, any tips on doing black scales, uh, colors, or advice? Um, I would definitely do a test, particularly if you're doing something as big as a dragon. Uh, think about what kind of black or what kind of mood you're trying to set. Uh, dull greens would look nice for some things. Purple would look nice for like spooky to work up with purples. In general, I would say slightly duller colors. So not, um, let me see if I have an example with me. I think I mostly have white color pink. All right, well, I cleaned off my desk before we did this. Well, I mean, I guess this is, so this is an example of a duller brown and more of an orange brown. So th this actually is kind of an orangey brown um it just has a way less orange than this so if you really want it to read as black i probably wouldn't use a lot of super saturated colors at least i would test before i use super saturated colors um so you might need to just dull down your purples or your greens or your blues or whatever you envision is, is it in the twilight if it's in the twilight you know blues and purples might look good um does it live in a forest then greens would make sense because it's helping it blend into the underbrush or something like that. So uh, I would I would kind of think of it from that point of view and then test colors that I felt matched my vision. And somebody said that their initial wash looked good while wet but seemed to disappear after it dried. Was it too thin? 
it was probably too thin. Um, and that is very easy to do, uh, particularly if you're if you're nervous about making a mistake. Um, so when you do the paper test, sometimes it helps if you need to let it dry so you can make sure that you still, you definitely want to see color when you do the paper test. So I'll take my original wash and thin it way down and we'll look at a comparison of what it looked like and see if that's what it looked like on your palette. It's hard to tell because I've got all. But that's what it looks like on my palette. And let's test it on the paper. You can see that it's a lot less intense. It's, it's making some brown, but I can really see all the text through it. It wouldn't, even if I painted this whole paper, I could still read it easily, where if I painted the paper that color, that would be pretty inconvenient to read. And this is still wet. So I'm gonna leave this here and it'll probably dry while we're talking. And you'll see that it's even lighter than you thought it was. Um, acrylic paint doesn't have a huge drying shift, but a drying shift is when a paint looks like one color when you, when you take it out of the bottle and a slightly different color once it dries. And so our miniature paints don't typically have a lot of problem with that. But what we do have a problem with is a wet paint looks a little darker than a dry paint. So I'll just put a drop of this on here and spread it around. And it looks maybe richer or darker or whatever because it's wet, because you're getting the effect of the glossiness. So uh, that also means a glossy paint can have a richer, um, darker, deeper. I mean, it, it, so the glossy paint is going to reflect stuff, so you're going to get reflections in the crevices, but it can also look deeper and richer. Um, so if I hold it the right way, you can tell it's the same color. But if, when I'm moving it around, in some places it's going to look lighter, and in some places it's going to look richer and darker. So you can see that this has started to lighten up even already. So it, it can be tough. So that you probably had some that looked good like that. And then when it dried, it looked like that. And that's you learning. That's you learning next time when you test, either let the test dry or dry with your hair dryer, or you know, just, just go a little darker than you feel comfortable with and hope that you're right. There are gonna be some colors that bore you sometimes. Um, I still have, I'll mix up colors and I'll end up with ones I didn't need or I needed a step in between and I just can't tell until I start painting. Um, colors are very unique, pigments are very unique. So there's not, like, like how I said, there's not a rule about we'll add X number of drops per drop of paint. Um, it, a lot of it is, you know, testing and observation and learning what to do the next time. And then somebody asks, their brush has a single hair longer than the others. It keeps leaving trails where he doesn't want them. Is it scissor time? It's a relatively new sable. Uh, if you do the scissors, just make sure you do this. So let me, here we go. So uh, don't cut here and don't pull it out. So don't pull a hair out, but try to isolate that hair. Just pull it to the side and then cut it off like somewhere there. So if you pull it out, you're making the brush head thinner and the other hairs are more likely to fall out of this metal ferrule thing. And if you cut the tip, you are likely to get some hairs you didn't mean to get to. And let me tell you, I'm 100% telling you that from experience. <laughs> I had a very nice brush that pretty quickly became a not very nice brush. Uh, and yeah, that is not at all unusual with um, sable brushes are made of actual hair and they're handmade by actual people. So they are not necessarily as consistent. I, well, and honestly, I get long hair, you know, weird hair like that sometimes on a synthetic brush. And I'll do the same thing. I'll pull it off to the side and chop it off. Um, and even if you want to make your brush have a finer tip, do, don't try to cut the tip. Pull some of the hairs to the side so that you still have the body, but you've, you've cut down so that not as many hairs go to the tip, which is effectively what this weird triangle brush is. You can see that some of the hairs are really short and then some of them are long, so it forms a fairly sharp tip. But once you've, like once a brush is at the point where it's not doing what you want anymore, like that's not necessarily a bad thing to kind of adjust it. 
The other thing you can do with brushes that are crummy that don't work anymore is cut it way down. And this is kind of, here, I'll move this distraction. This is kind of an eraser now. So like I said, the paint doesn't cure right away, right? Uh, the darker shades are only in the shadow. Um, so if you, if you look here, so the one I was doing, I actually did two steps of shading. So I did a little bit here. I came under here. I went along these edges, went under his arms. It's places where the sun isn't going as much. So if you think of the sun as coming down from here, light travels in a straight line, it's the places that that straight line isn't reaching are where you would add extra shadows. Well, thank you, Norm, that's very nice of you to say. Yeah, if you guys wanna to go to my Discord channel on the uh, RBE event thing and post your figures and share them with each other and ask some more questions, that would be great. Uh, Speaking of Discord, do you have a code for an emote on Discord at all? I know some of the streamers yep. have it. Oh, is that the code? That is the code. I had it up in the beginning and then I forgot about it. Thank you for asking about it. Because I did mean to mention it again. I had written it down and then I didn't look at my paper anymore. And then the last thing I have is this. So if you come here, I post uh, tips and tricks uh, like the leprechaun that I just painted for Reaper. I haven't posted it yet, but I've been working on a post. I'm going to list all the colors I used uh, and some suggestions for how I what order I painted things in because it actually was unexpectedly not as obvious as I thought what order I would paint things in on that. Um, if you go to YouTube, Bird with a Brush is my YouTube channel. There's a couple things there. I have a Patreon. Um, I don't have a lot of videos on my Patreon yet. It's mainly to support the blog so that I can kind of do all this stuff for everybody. Um, but there are some Patreon exclusive, patron exclusive things. And that includes a video on painting skills and a video on painting fur that I did. Um, there was a different convention and I recorded the videos. Um, there's some uh, like a little color reference sheet. There's a few other things that are kind of patron exclusives, but um, I like to try to share kind of with the larger audience if I can, but I also have to pay some bills. So I'm trying to weigh the, weigh the balance. But if you like the idea of me sharing with a larger audience, please consider supporting me um, on my Patreon and that will help me do that. But I am thinking about doing um, another level with video lessons and stuff like that. Uh, there is a question that we can uh, take yeah. over to Discord if you want, and it's uh, on the topic of doing dragons. Would you have any particular tips for handling spikes intermingled and or coming out of the scales? Like, would you do anything different with the scales? Um, I would probably paint the spikes differently just for interest, because a dragon is a lot of the same thing, like a lot of scales. Um, also, just for ease of painting, I would do the scales first and then come back and do whatever I was going to do with the spikes. I'm not your top person for paint. I don't paint a ton of large figures. I painted a few. I did the um, Hydra for uh, the, the last Kickstarter and a couple other things. But um, I don't personally actually paint a ton of uh, big figures and I haven't painted a lot of dragons. But in theory, that is what I would do is I would paint the scales and then I would probably want the spikes to be, even if they were like a similar color, not identical. I did paint the little Rockies uh, and there are pictures of those on my Facebook, I think. They predate the, the um, website. So I don't think I have stuff of the Rockies up there, but they did have like back spikes. They weren't intermingled with the scales, but they have like an area where there were more spikes, I think. And then I think I did those in black and then the scales in red. And I, that is the order I did. I painted all the scales for it to actually use the airbrush, although I had to go in and do a lot of hand painting after that. Just those scales are very big and they don't have a lot of definition. So, um, techniques that work like techniques like this that worked on trying to use the definition they have definition but they're it's just different so i ended up having to do layering instead of being able to use the airbrush directionally i love the rockies and i enjoyed painting them i just one of those situations where i went in with one idea of how i would paint it and actually painting it turned into a different experience so that happens to all of us like you can have a lot of experience and still 
you you try something and it doesn't turn out the way that you thought it would. So um, I'm glad you guys like the Rocky. I've been very excited to see how other people are painting them. I had to paint them all the same color because they're they're all Rocky. He's just doing different things. And Ron wanted it to be that color. But I love the idea of seeing him different colors. So I always enjoy when people put up cool colors of Rocky. I mean, he's fun in red too, but so I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Um, I have no idea how many people were here. If there was a way to check that. But, uh, you peaked you, at 188. Oh my goodness. But if you miss stuff or you want to go through it again, like you didn't have the correct paints or you didn't, you didn't like the colors you chose, Reaper's going to be posting these. And I will possibly, since I have some leftover half painted guys, I might make a video myself and put it up, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. But um, I suspect that uh, Sarah needs to get on with the rest of her life now because I think we're the latest class. So. It's all it's all good. I don't need sleep. I work nights anyways. <laughs> so hopefully you guys had fun and you feel much more comfortable about um, 